and Maxime Delpierre. Uh, Maxime Delpierre is a, an alumnus of the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and a philosophy teacher. He is currently uh, completing a PhD in uh, Islamology at the Ecole um, de Pratique. And his research focuses on the commentary of uh, Ali Sharat Ben Siridin Tusi. And uh, Dr. De, uh, Dr. Lapierre will be um, uh, presenting on the Nizari reception of Avicennism, Nasiruddin Tusi, between Avicennism and Ismailism. Thank you. Well, first, I, uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers of the conference for their invitation. My paper tackle, tackles the subject of the Nizari reception of Avicennism in Nasiruddin Tusi's work. Nasir Tusi's contribution to the formation of the Avicennian tradition is so well established that his school of thoughts has been called Marara Avicennism from the name of the Marara Observatory that he founded. There, Tusi is surrounded by Avicennian philosophers such as Al Abhari, Al Khatibi, who contributed to spread Avicenna's influence in the Islamic world. He is also surrounded by Shafi'i jurists who contributed to form the very idea of an Avicennian school. And finally, he is surrounded by 12 Ashi philosophers and theologians, such as Al-Arama Al-Hilli, who elaborated the new 12 Ashi rational theology on a philosophical basis. Tusi is at the very center of all these convergent strategies of revival of Avicennism in 12 Ashi milieus. His main contribution in this regard is his own commentary on the Isharat, Hal Mushkilat al Isharat, which durably fixes the canon of true philosophy. There is one source text, the Isharat, one method, an explanation, Sharh, rather than a criticism, Jarh, and one truth, that of the true interpreter, Al Muhaqqiq. As a super commentary on Fakhruddin Razi's commentary on the Isharat, Tusi's work presented itself as the true interpretation of Avicenna's text. It even transformed the exegetical genre itself from explanation to arbitration, from sharh to muhakama, among the 12 Ashi disciples of Tusi, such as Atustari and Atathani in the 14th century. Uh, this so called Marara Avicennism has already been in this gestation in Tusi's Nizari career. Indeed, Tusi's commentary, which has become the textbook of Marara Avicennism and the touchstone of the 12 Ashi reception of Avicennism, is a Nizari work. As a matter of fact, in a historical context of trouble, Tusi is known for his controversial political and religious affiliations. And in this respect, his life and work went through two main periods. But after about 20 years of allegiance to Nizari Ismailism, after the fall of Alamut in 1256, he rallies to the Mongol conquerors and supports 12 Shiism. So in this paper, I intend to indicate that Tusi, commenting on the Isharat, considers that Avicenna's philosophy should be an initiation to Nizari doctrine. And yet, it is not at all self-evident, because Ismaili theology had been built uh, against Avicenna's metaphysics by Sheikh Rastani in Musarat al falasifa Therefore, Tusi has to resolve deep doctrinal contradiction between both systems of thought. Much more, in his late polemical work against Sheikh Rastani, Masari al Musari. He even suggests that Avicenna's metaphysics would have been the most compatible with Ismaili theological doctrines. So first, uh, in his spiritual autobiography, Sayyid Wasuluk, Nasir Tusi describes the different successive stages of his intellectual formation and career that led him to the Nizari doctrine. Religious studies, mathematics, rational theology, philosophy, and then Ismailism marked the five stages of his search for truth. Ismailism is supposed to be better than philosophy. Indeed, instruction at Ta'lim conveys true knowledge, that is, knowledge of the nature of God and of the afterlife, whereas mere reason, al-aql, does not. 
from this point of view, Avicenna's philosophy should be disqualified uh, because it does not convey the ultimate, uh, the ultimate truth. And yet, Tusi's commentary was commissioned by an Ismaili prince, Motasham Shahabuddin. So we may wonder what theological benefit was expected in studying such a philosophical work, which is supposed to convey no certainty on the most fundamental question, the nature of God, and of the afterlife. If the Nizari doctrine is the only one that instructs true knowledge, al-ma'arif al and certain sciences, al ulum al theoretical philosophy is worth being studied insofar as it is related to truth and certitude, yunsab il al wal yaqeen That is why it is a mere preparation, istiadal, to the true doctrine. But then, why comment on the Isharats in particular? There is no other explanation in the preface than a rather conventional praise of Avicenna's philosophy and a protest against Razi's exegetical method. I shall leave aside this polemical aspect of the commentary to focus only on the theoretical benefits a Nizari scholar finds in the text. It may be wondered to what extent the commentator is ideologically committed in his commentary, all the more since, since he claims to stick to the text. So I would like to list a number of passages where our author makes an unequivocal use of Ismaili terminology to comment on Avicenna's text, using, using categories of his Nizari works, such as Raudat al-Taslim, Arazda Anjam, Tavalla Tabarra, and Matlub al Mu'minin. Such terminology is first used at the end of the third chapter, the chapter of psychology on heavenly and earthly souls, to explain the principle of voluntary movement, that is, perception, desire, decision, and corporeal forces. What is significant here is that the commentator explains Avicenna's theory of voluntary motion using his own Nizari classification of desires mentioned in Tavalla Vatabarra. Lust and anger, shahwa wa radad, will and dislike, irada wa karaha. Certainly, some differences may be noted between the two contexts, but there is no doubt that Avicennian psychology and Nizari doctrine meet. This Nizari reference is all the more significant since it will be taken up in the famous ninth chapter on the spiritual journey of the mystics. According to Avicenna, will, al-irada, is the very principle of the spiritual journey towards God, as suluk. The theoretical perfection of the soul, that is certitude, and the practical perfection of the soul, that is tranquility, determine the will to move towards God. And whereas certitude is conveyed by demonstration, tranquility is conveyed through acceptance of the speech of the imams who guide towards God. The commentator connects directly this paragraph and the above mentioned one to explain the spiritual movement of the, of the Sufi Maris, al murid so there is a close link between the movement of the corporeal soul and the spiritual journey of the mystics under the direction of the imams. It is no coincidence if another Nizari reference is taken up to explain the distinction of the three states of man in the search for truth. The ascetic, al-Zahid, the worshipper, al-Abid, and the sage, al-Arif. Once more, these stages are expressed in Nizari terms. Asceticism and worship correspond to dissociation and solidarity. Tabarra wa tawalla. And in the Nizari classification of desires, it is the highest degree. So the three religious states of man, according to Avicenna, are contained in a way in the Nizari doctrine. And not only the new Avicennian philosopher, as a Arif, may reach God's reality, but he can also reach the afterlife's reality. 
Indeed, the sage not only has intellectual knowledge of pleasure and pain, but he also experiences it in his life. He experiences in his life the happiness of the afterlife. This feeling is expressed by Avicenna using Suf Sufi terminology, as dark, uh, a ta uh, the taste, and al makasat as sorrow, the, the sorrow. Uh, but once more, the commentator superimposes on it his own terminology. In misery terms, mere intellectual knowledge corresponds to science of certitude, al and at the upper stage, uh, intellectual vision, uh, mushahada, corresponds to the essence of certitude, al the meaning is that mere in scientific knowledge, al ilm, cannot reach ethical and eschatological objects, but it needs besides mystical vision. To finish with, from if uh, from a theoretical point of view, Avicenna's new philosophy conveys true knowledge. From the practical point of view, Avicenna's ethics conveys true happiness. According to the description of the Arif moral character, the sage is pleased with the truth and indifferent to everything. To see superimposes on this character his own misery notion of contentment, Arrida. So it is sufficient evidence that our commentator indulges in a partial reading of the text. These Nizari notions are supposed to be implicitly contained in the text, and the commentator only has to make them explicit, as if Avicenna himself was a crypto Nizari. And yet, it is the second part of my presentation, there is nothing less evident than trying to reconcile Nizari Ismailism and Avicennism. Indeed, not only there are a lot of doctrinal incompatibilities, but Nizari theology had also taken a radically opposite direction through Shahrastani's influence at the beginning of the 12th century. Shahrastani is known as a Nashari theologian and Ismaili sympathizer, deeply influenced by Ghazali's critic of Avicenna. And in the same vein, he deepens the opposition between Asharism and Avicennism in Musara'at al falasifa struggling with the philosopher. On many issues, division of being, existence, unity, and science of God, creation of the world, uh, secondary causes, the author prefers Ashari to Avicennian solution to develop the most coherent theology in accordance with his Ismaili principles. Frank Griffel has listed the points of doctrinal dissent between Ismailism and Avicennism from Shahrastani's point of view. First of all, the principle that commands all the others is that God is absolutely transcendent. From there on, Shahrastani obviously takes the side of the theologians against the philosophers on many issues unknowability of God's essence and action, equivocity of the divine attributes, arbitrary will of God and no principle of reason, direct creation of everything, temporal creation and particular knowledge of the individuals. Shahrastani broadly agrees with Avicenna on physics and psychology but not on metaphysics. From a theological point of view, Avicennism would be an associationism. The key point of the debate is the proof of God's existence. According to Shahrastani, God does not need to be, prove, to be proved, or rather, he cannot be proved. God's existence cannot be deduced from the notion of existence in general. So, Islamic theology is not compatible with a philosophical ontology. That is why, from a theological point of view, Avicenna theology is explicitly considered as a heresy twice. It is compared to Karamism, 
insofar as it would attribute corporal properties to God and also to Christianism insofar as it sets, it sets many aspects irtibarat, in the divine essence. Here are the main reasons why Avicennism and Ismailism are from the outset antagonistic. The Ismaili apophatic theology is confronted with the following dilemma. Either God is the cause of the world and he cannot be transcendent, or God is transcendent and he cannot be the cause of the world. Indeed, if he is a cause, he is relative to his effect, so he is not absolute. And if he is absolute, he has no relation to anything, so he cannot cause anything. Yet, Tusi tries to prove that there is absolutely no problem of divine transcendence in the Avicennian theology. So first, the commentator stresses the absolute transcendence of Avicenna's God in the fourth chapter of the Isharat, the metaphysical chapter on being and its causes. According to Razi, the proof of God's immateriality is based on a comparison Tamthil, between God and creators. It presupposes that the real one is comparable to all realities. The theological problem is clear. Avicenna would not be exempt from assimilationism, tashbih. So to see has to, to justify the proof. What Avicenna means is that the real one, al-haq, is not a mere reality, haqika, but the re realizator of every reality. Thus, God's transcendence is saved. The positive attribute, being real, is to be considered in a factitive sense, that is, giving reality. And this is a typical Ismaili method. For example, according to Sheikh Rastani in his Musara, referring to divine attributes, Avicenna shall mean by existence what gives existence to what exists by necessary, what necessitates, what is necessary, by perfection, what gives perfection to what is perfect, etc. It is a typical Ismaili doctrine, madhab at Why is our commentator so interested in stressing the identity between Avicennian and Nizari theologies? Avicenna's doctrine of God as a necessary being corresponds to the Ismaili doctrine of the divine order, al-amr, as a mediation between the first principle and the universe. In that way, God is supposed to be at the same time related as, as a cause, as a necessary being, and absolute in himself, as a self-subsisting being, al-qayyum. Likewise, God is at the same time unknowable for us, but knowable in himself. There is also obvious evidence that the commentary follows an ideological agenda on this topic. As a matter of fact, in Sayyid Wasuluk, Tusi asserts that philosophy has taught him in particular that knowing effect through their cause, that is deduction, is better than knowing a cause through its effects, that is induction. This distinction between both modes of knowledge is established in the commentary of the paragraph on the knowledge of God. For creators, there are only three ways to know God's existence. First, the theological proof of the creator from the existence of creators. Second, the physical proof of a prime mover from the existence of movement. And third, the, metaphys the metaphysical proof of a necessary being from the division of being into necessary and possible. It is clear that the first two proofs correspond to the proof of the cause through the effects, and the third to the proof of the effect through the cause. This later method is the best demonstrative one because it conveys certitude. The philosophical method therefore appears as the closest to God's knowledge of himself. But in the same time, if God is radically transcendent, uh, he shall be necessarily unknowable. 
That is why our commentator tries to confirm that Avicenna's God is as unknowable as he is in the Nizari theology. In his commentary on the proofs of God's existence and essence, Tusi maintains the radical unknowability of God. God has no quiddity at all, and he is not knowable through intellectual notion. He has no definition either. Thus, in a way, God is unknowable as a transcendent principle, but not absolutely unknowable. Theological philosophy is the highest knowledge of God accessible to human reason. Nevertheless, rational investigation, al-ba'th, al-nadar, is not sufficient and shall be completed by unveiling, al-kashf. Thus, uh, to see totally diffuses the pivotal criticism of Shahrastani. Ontology is not incompatible with God's transcendence. Avicenna's metaphysics fits Nizari theology perfectly. In that way, philosophy as Irfan may be a preparation to the Nizari doctrine and to see has dismissed the metaphysical obstacles. Um, I would have liked to uh, develop a third principle, uh, um, a third part on some criticism that to see addressed to Shahrastani on uh, his uh, theological and uh, uh, cosmological options, but I uh, think I have no time to do, uh, do that, so I let it for the, the question and answer session. Thank you. <laughs>